That's a live stream, I think. That's good. Yeah. Mm. Is that the continuing? That's us on. Yes, we are on YouTube. Excellent. Um, okay, so hi everyone. Welcome to our afternoon's keynote with Louise Creighton. Um, thanks very much everyone for coming. I hope you're having a good day. Um, now that we're in webinar format, I cannot um, see you on my screen. We can't do hands up. We can't have you coming on camera for questions. But we now do have a Q&A function at the bottom, as you'll see. So if you would like to ask a question, then please do put it in the Q&A. And you can use the chat for just random blethers. And please do that because it's always nice to you know have a bit of a commentary. So yeah, if you do want a specific question to ask Louise, pop it in the q and a that'll just be a bit easier for me to see everything in one place and on the chat say whatever you like um i'm not gonna I, I might monitor it a little bit to see if there's anything that comes up that might be a useful topic for questions but definitely be handier to keep the official questions in a separate place um okay so let's welcome louise louise is a lecturer in the lecture medical humanities at durham university she is a neurodivergent academic and works on Victorian literature, neurodiversity, and the history of not reading. Her first monograph, I'm writing Victorian illiteracy, questioning the primacy of literacy in 19th century literature and culture, is currently under review and will hopefully be published by the end of the year. Congratulations in advance. Her current project, The Dunce's Hat, continues her investigation of Victorian constructs of intelligence to interrogate and disrupt the neurotypical biases of the field. And her planned second book will blend an auto-ethnographic approach with literary analysis and critical theory to work towards a neurodivergent framework for literary scholarship. And she is a co-host of the academic comedy podcast, Law My Praxis. Um, she's called her keynote, Lifting the Veil, neurodivergence and narrative. Do you want to take it away, Louise? Thank you. Okay, um, thanks so much um, for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to preface this talk with um, some of the ideas that I'm going to be floating here are very, very much work in progress. And as such, you know, I am more than happy to receive feedback. I'm more than happy to have conversations about um, things that come up. Um, because as I say, this is absolute work in progress stuff um and um which means i'm you know slightly more nervous than usual to be presenting but it's fine we, we can all handle it um together um another kind of uh, note about sort of access and things apologies for anyone who um would want a transcript um to the talk in advance or to follow along um unfortunately for my own access needs i am unable to provide that because i don't use a script but we will there will be sort of opportunities for us i think to transcribe the talk um after the event um so that's not going to be um too much of an issue for folk i hope Okay, so um, in terms of positionality, so this is also something that I've been thinking about really recently, and it's something that perhaps we can have a talk about after um, the keynote, is um, I am coming to this piece um, and, and this research with the lived experience of neurodivergent. I myself am dyslexic, dyspraxic, and ADHD. Um, and I think that's important for thinking about where we're coming from. I know Ria Jean's uh, keynote earlier was talking about the practices of citation. Um, so talking about sort of whether we should be disclosing, whether it's important to disclose, I would argue that it is really important um, sort of for empowerment to, to sort of, if we want to be serious about neurodiversity as a movement, then I think it's really important that we, you know, can put, faces to divergence experiences and things. I think it's really, really um, important, but I'm gonna get off my soapbox. But, but I think that's something that if we have time in the questions, I'd really like to ask folk about that because that's where I think I stand, but I'm, I'm willing to be corrected and persuaded. Okay, so um, I'm a Victorianist. So I um, admittedly know very little about fantasy literature. Um, so I'm more kind of interested in taking you guys through a sort of approach that I'm developing. I will be using Victorian examples because that's what I know, um, but hopefully it's going to be useful and kind of key into some of the conversations that we were having earlier um, and during the panels. Um, so, but I'm just going to hold my hands up and say, 
it fancy isn't my area, but I'm really excited to talk about approaches. Um, and I think also um, when we start to think about what a neurodivergent literary framework might look like, what a critical framework based on divergence might look like, I think the potential in fantasy from the tiny bit that I know about it, which again, isn't much, I think the potential of fantasy is enormous for this, you know, sort of other worlds, non-humans and, and this sort of thing. So I think it's a really, I think someone needs to get in on that area because I mean, you guys already are, but it's, it's super exciting. So during the course of this talk, I'm gonna to speak to these sorry, Louise, Sorry, Louise, can I just interrupt quickly? Um, Marita, are you there? Because I don't know if the closed captioning is turned on and um, I was just wondering if it's possible to get that switched on. Sorry, Louise, I've sent Marita a private message, but um, she hasn't replied to me and I just don't want you to like go all the way through the talk when people can't follow. Um, oh, no, no, that's absolutely fine. I'm, I'm happy to wait. Thank you, sorry. I think Marita is there, so I've just seen her come off me oh. and go back on. So, oh, yes, that looks good. Okay. Yeah, um, that looks okay. That looks good to me. All right, thank you, Louise. So sorry to interrupt. No, no, you're you're absolutely fine. Um, cool. Right. So, um, I was talking. Um, if people missed it, um, about sort of questions about positionality um, and talking about my coming to this from a lived experience in neurodivergence and I really wanted to kind of open up in the questions to think about disclosure and how we're approaching neurodivergence as neurodivergent scholars or as neurotypical scholars who are engaging with these ideas. Um, I was also holding up my hands to say I'm not a fantasy person but in this huge potential in fantasy but I'm going to be talking about approaches. Okay so um, I am going to hopefully answer um, these questions and talk, or at least speak to these questions because I don't think I can answer them. So the central question that I'm really obsessed with at the moment um, is what would a neurodivergent critical framework look like for literary scholarship? And when I'm talking about a neurodivergent literary framework, I'm thinking not just about representational politics, not just about identification of characters, the kind of might think along the lines of diagnosis, but to think in terms of sort of critical theory and what it's doing, not just at the level of characterization and the level of how a sort of society of a novel is, is, is functioning, but at the level of text itself. So thinking really to sort of the movement that went through the sort of phases of queer theory, when we started off thinking about um, characters that might have some sort of, you know, queerness about them in terms of sexuality, politics and things, but now it's quite possible to read a text queerly, just looking at um, sort of disturbances and um, tensions within the text itself as an entity. So I'm thinking along similar lines for neurodivergence, because it is kind of a way of seeing the world, a way of perception um, at the sort of root of it. So along with this question of, you know, what does a framework look like for literary scholars? I'm also really interested in what does research look like for neurodivergent scholars? What does what what should research look like? So, you know, um, we are so used to working within a very neurotypical framework with the sort of publishing cycle of academia. But for folk with sort of reading and writing difficulties um, like myself, this is always requiring me to, to act within an area of weakness and to be assessed along the same lines. It, it requires me to kind of put my own strengths which I, I I mean I think I'm I think I'm a much better speaker than I am a writer um but to put that to one side and to sort of function in a way that fits so I'm really also interested in this work about how we might expand how we think about knowledge production and how we might disseminate that research and whether we have to use the same strictures that we've always used in the academy and this isn't just a call for neurodivergent academics but also for everyone working in academia, um, I think it's a it's sort of a methodological intervention is a sort of an access issue. So I'm talking um, as disability theorists have spoken about this idea between the tension between consumptive access and transformative access. So consumptive access is that idea of, you know, being in the space as an entry into the academic discourse, whereas transformative access is this idea that we can restructure and reproduce and not reproduce, co-produce and, and change the way that we um, present our research, the way that we function within academia. It's not just about entering, but it's a changing, enabling that space. So um, to speak to this, 
um, something that I've done in the past um, with my, my doctoral thesis, but also hopefully if, uh, if they actually get round to, you know, get my book out of the way. Um, my conclusion in both of these um, things was done um, as an as a unscripted audio recording. Now, the reason for that is because my doctoral project was on illiteracy and learning difficulty and the sort of intersections with the rise of mass literacy in the 19th century. But I was getting really frustrated in the process of writing because I was having severe writing difficulties and I just was getting to the point where I didn't think that I would be able to work in this way. Um, so with a lot of soul searching, I came up with this solution because the, the solution um, actually came out of a conversation with um, Alice Jenkins at, at Glasgow. And I, um, I sort of said, you know, I'm really struggling with this one. And she suggested take off spell check like, you know, don't be worried about things. It will be your own authentic voice, which I thought was a great idea. But then I sort of, then I thought about it. It was like, well, but, you know, if I did that, then I'm still exposing these supposed deficits. And the person reading is still going to be seeing that. And okay, so it might be taking ownership of it, but it's still kind of lessening, perhaps, what I was, what I was coming out with. So then I thought about doing the audio recording. But then it would have to be unscripted because I just I wanted to find a way to circumvent the sort of written um, parameters of how we're expected to research and work, hence the unscripted nature. And it would it allowed me to reflect on sort of the primacy of literacy, not only in relation to Victorian novels, which is the subject of my work, but also in the contemporary academy and how we think about disseminating knowledge. So that's all I'm gonna really talk about in terms of methodologies, but I think it's something that is a conversation that would be really interesting to have sort of at the end of this talk, or if people have ideas about how we might kind of neurodiversify the academy, that would be really cool because that is also um, a, bit of a, a bit of a mission for me. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna be taking us through kind of two case studies of how I think a critical framework for um, neurodiversion literary scholarship might function. Um, but of course, I am more than willing for people to feedback. So really quickly, um, those of you who have been at the conference and those of you that work on neurodiversity studies will, will know these terms. But for folk that are just joining on YouTube or just for this, um, just for this keynote, I'm just going to really quickly run through um, where we're coming to neurodiversity um, studies from. So neurodiversity Neurodiversity studies, sorry, is the critical con consideration that there is a diversity of neurotypes that exist within society. So this encompasses both the neurotypical and the neurodivergent. Neurotypical is the state of being neurologically typical according to the sort of parameters of the society that we're looking at. So in my case, because I'm a Victorianist, I'm looking at the sort of parameters and expectations of Victorian society, um, but you know, if you guys are fantasy scholars, then you might be working within the sort of parameters of fantasy worlds and neuro, neuro, neurology, can I say it? Neurology might be functioning different in your world. So we're talking about sort of standards and normatives um, in that sense. Neurodivergence, therefore, is a divergence from that neurotypical norm that's been established. So diagnostically, this might come into conditions such as autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, or sort of neurological changes as a result of traumatic brain injury or mental illness. So this idea about sort of divergence is what I'm gonna really lean into here. So I am of course not the first person to think about the sort of analytical and semantic and narrative qualities, uh, not narrative, and rhetorical qualities of um, neurodivergent language and neurodivergent text. So um, this, is a, this is quite an early article in this from 2011, in which Paul Heilke and Remy Yergo um, state that autism is a rhetoric, a way of being through the world through language. And that sort of concentration on language, I think is really, really interesting because it, it does pave the way for a, a mode of literary framework or a scholarship in terms of um, divergence um, that we can really benefit from. Um, Remy Ergo, of course, is um, the author of Authoring Autism, um, which is another, this is sort of a text that ponders rhetoric on a far more sophisticated level than I can deal with um, in my own keynote. It, it's it's um, a really fantastic work. 
Similarly, um, Julia Mille Rodas in her book, um, Autistic Disturbances in 2018, puts forward a framework that notes autistic qualities within literary text, qualities such as echolalia, the sort of repetition, and that sort of stimming, and also stimming, that sort of self-soothing way that language and text might function. And now in, in Autistic Disturbances, um, Rodas shows how literary modernism is in particular, but other literary kind of forms are, are very much praised for their engagement with these sort of alternative qualities of language and these constructions and this and the, and the way that the, the text is structured. However, once an autism diagnosis is applied to a text or a character or an author, or even a person in everyday society that um, talks or, or writes in these kind of autistic modes of um, expression, um, this shuts down the conversation and negates it. So while it's seen as genius in terms of literary figures who are associated with being neurotypical, it's seen as a disturbance or a pathology of autistic experience. So she writes against that. Now, for me, and this is why I'm talking about um, uh, frameworks of neurodivergence, setting these theories within the sort of parameters of, of critical autism studies has been fantastic and, and really empowering um, for um, autistic folk and autistic scholars. But essentially, you're still using the categorizations of diagnosis to sort of function through these sort of seeing pathologies in language and seeing symptoms of a condition um, that's sort of very much identified. And um, for me, I think that we really do need to sort of widen what we think of as, as divergence, because I think we can open far more sort of perspectives on this, um, on this issue and sort of see new ways of seeing and perceiving things. Um, so another aspect that if we're talking about sort of critical legacy is this idea of sort of almost diagnosing um, characters or using um, fiction as a, as a means of, sort of exploring um, the divergence of an author. Um, so this is a sort of discourse that I think it's, it's really unproductive to engage with, um, although it is really, really tempting, particularly as a neurodivergent person and, you know, wanting to see yourself represented in text or similarly, you know, for neurodivergent children, I think it's really, um, there, there is a sense of like finding yourself within um, culture. Um, to sort of not feel so alone or to feel empowered um, by some aspects of your divergence. We were talking earlier about, um, well, Rhea Chain was talking about um, the language of HR in terms of um, hyper-focus in ADHD. And, 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 you know, that, that can be positive for some folk, but I think when we're talking in terms of literary scholarship, that it's quite dangerous. So really briefly, um, one of the key texts from the sort of 19th century that's been used for this is um, Herman Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the short story, essentially a scrivener comes to work at a law office. It's uh, he's, the job is to sort of copy documents. Um, and he just and he begins to sort of actively refuse to participate in his job and then he refuses to leave and he just refuses refuses and the the phrase he uses which is on a mug helpfully here is i would prefer not to and sort of really cheesily i would prefer not to engage with um um diagnostic um modes of analysis um but this sort of echolalia as as some scholars have identified it if we are to read that as an autistic trait, then it's pitched kind of as a substitute for plot itself. So it doesn't give the story its kind of own agency for being a narrative, for having plot sort of driven. It's, it's become centered around a pathology as opposed to um, a textual entity that we can explore and we can find different opinions and different, different readings of. Um, similarly, scholars have used this to explore supposedly Melville's autistic qualities or the character Bartleby's autistic qualities. And um, to use Rodas here, um, she is very, you'll see in the language, is extremely critical of this practice. This idea of it being contaminating and the poisonous effect of clinical autism discourse on literary reading, the promotion of an attitude of non-listening 
the sort of shutting down of conversation. Um, and to use this critical analysis in this way as an execution of an autism autopsy, a form of forensic scrutiny that mutilates as it lays bare the inert pathology of the textual body. So this idea that the body of text is essentially mutilated and left behind um, and all that's kind of left is this kind of pathology that we can now see stripped back. So we can't see the sort of qualities of text out with that pathology and that pathology here is um, sort of diagnostic. So moving on to, well, there was a question that arose at, in the Q&A for um, the earlier keynote, this idea about, well, how do we use um, neurodivergence or you know, neurodiversity as an, as an approach for historical texts? Well, as a Victorianist, the answer that I've come up with for this is to lean into that sense of divergence. I think for a, a neurodivergent critical framework, which is what I keep kind of coming back to, is kind of what I'm, I'm wanting to develop. The thing that we need to do is to think about it in non-diagnostic terms and just to lean into that idea about being separate from the normative and what that means in the greater context. So for me, I'm able to look at historical text through this framework because I'm, I'm identifying divergence as opposed to specific conditions. And I think that's really freeing because also it means that as I will talk later in this, in this keynote about uh, a text that has a clairvoyant narrator, we can read that as a divergence because clairvoyance of course is a divergence from um, normative neurologies. Um, so this is where I'm coming from, from when, when I'm sort of applying divergence or divergent framework to um, 19th century texts. Okay, so my first case study, I'm actually gonna do some, some literary scholarship after um, talking for quite a long time about general kind of, sort of blue sky things. So um, I'm gonna be thinking about um, some examples from, an, an example from Sensation Novel, looking at what neurodivergent readers can do in the space of text, so readers within the text it's themselves. Um, and I want to think about how neurodivergent reading Neurodivergent readers essentially challenge our assumptions about reading. And this is sort of dramatized in um, the example I'm going to use, which is Wilkie Collins' No Name. So I'm really interested in this minor character, uh, Matilda Rag. She's described as being, quote, constitutionally torpid. She has been I directly identified as neurologically different. Of course, there's no diagnostic framework here, but we have this, this clear awareness of her difference, of her divergence, right? The thing that's really interesting here is in sensation novels, sensation novels were a genre that came, for those of you who aren't Victorians, who came, that came out in sort of 1860s, and they were kind of the first genre that really um, united the classes um, in terms of the readership. So the, the plots would be well, literally sensational. It's the sort of realm of um, bigamous marriages and you know lost documents and wills and, and shocking revelations. Um, and they were as popular um, with working class readers as they were with middle class readers. So there's a bit of a crisis of um, of sort of literacy levels that happened at the same time that these novels came out um, to give some context. Now, the sensation novel, just to really distill it down, is essentially a novel about literacy. It's a genre about literacy. And I'm, I'm, I mean that on multiple levels. I mean that um, first in terms of the plot, because very often um, in these novels, it will be the, the crux of the action or the, or, the, or the drama comes out of a misinterpretation of something or a lost document or that a will or a legal work hasn't been filed properly or a technicality of the law. So we're talking about kind of at the, at the very at the very base level a sort of the technicalities of the written word. So it's really about literacy. Similarly, it's about if there's a lost document, it might be a, a thing about who's read what, who understands what. So you've got these levels of different um, engagements with the sort of key text within the novel. And as I said, um, the, these novels really engage with literacy because of the social context that they're coming out with. As such, because there was such a kind of uproar about this uh, sort of mix of, um, of folk reading and about the, the, the 
poisonous effects of these novels and sensation novels, um, there was quite a lot of outcry in the conservative press. So most famously and infamously, should I say, Henry Longfield Mansell writing in 1863 in, in response to um, Braddon's um, Lady of the Secret and or Floyd and several um, sensation novels. Um, he accused them of preaching to the nerves instead of the judgment. So this idea about sensation doesn't just occur on the level of plot. There's also this idea about reader reaction. They, it was really put forward by conservative critics that they would affect your nerves reading too many sensation novels because of the shocks and the twists and turns. Um, and but there's this notion about um, sort of bodily reading over um, over. Um, I don't know, mental discourses or, or, or sort of engagement with, with the text on a sort of cerebral level. So in comes Matilda Wragg. Now, as I've established, she was a neurodivergent character and she can read, she is literate, but she has difficulties. And the, and the way that she encounters text is essentially disabling. So she states, as sure as ever, I sit down to this book, the buzzing in my head begin again. So this idea of buzzing um, is really interesting, kind of within the concept, within the concept, in the space of sensation novels. Because as I've established, we've got this idea that um, sensation novels were preaching to the nerves of the judgment. So we've got this, they were also nicknamed the electric novel, similarly for working along these lines of sensation and on these discourses of nerves. So when we have this buzzing in her head, it kind of induces this idea about thinking about electricity in the air about, um, it's almost kind of parodying the effect of the sensation novel um, to sort of larger proportions via her divergence. So here, um, I think that we have a sort of semantic, uh, somatic reading, but that's um, kind of exaggerated. Um, so it dramatizes the sort of um, neurotypical process of reading to kind of parody effect. This period was also the period in which the telegraph was kind of first being used um, on a large scale. And the concept that there could possibly be these kind of electrical impulses going around the air at the same time is quite intimidating for Victorians. Um, I have referred to it in the past as being like Victorian 5G in that it's there, but a lot of folk don't trust it. Um, so this idea about telegraphing and telegraphing through reading, the signals that she's gaining from the book itself, as I will kind of demonstrate later, it's this idea that it's unlimited for the first time, that, that, that through space, things can be communicated, things can be received through kind of limitless space. Um, so that there's a sense that um, through this kind of buzzing and this in invocation of, of, of the language of the telegraph, we're dealing with a, a space that's not limited, but indeed limitless. So this comes to bear as she's trying to read a recipe for an omelet. Um, and essentially she's unable to filter the relevant information and instead receives all possible meanings from the text. So here we have her saying, you know, mint small, there, mint small. How am I to put mint small when it's all mixed up and running? Um, put a piece of butter the size of your thumb into the frying pan, but look at my thumb and, and look at yours. Whose size does it mean? Oil, but not brown. If it mustn't be brown, then what colour should it be? So there's this essential questioning of everything that comes through that might not have been picked up from those who are able to filter information for relevancy. So we see this kind of divergent reading tactic here. Um, so it's, she's essentially overreached the point where it becomes to the point where the text begins to lose meaning. So again, this kind of idea about limitlessness in in, in sort of the creation of meaning via neurodivergent reading practices within the text. So here, essentially, she exposes the kind of inherent ambiguities of text itself as a as a sort of as a thing. Um, and the sort of ambiguities that occur in the space between reading and constructing meaning. And in that space, that's for neurotypical readers might disregard information as irrelevant, but in her divergence, she does not. So her questioning of the, sort of the, the seemingly banal um, meaning of this text kind of co-ops the reader into a sustained engagement with these supposed irrelevancies. 
And it implies that the neurotypical dismissal of the full range of interpretive possibilities might actually be nonsensical in itself when we can see so many ambiguities arising. So within these ambiguities, her reading practice kind of implies that the written word itself possesses its own kind of slippery agency and that reading can never equate to mastery if there is room for all these ambiguities. And we see this as triangulated through her divergent reading practices. So within this text as well, we've got two kind of big moments of Matilda Rag reading. And it's interesting because, again, if we're, if we're using a divergent um, framework for looking at this character, this means that it's unstable. And so the author, Wilkie Collins, uses this unstable reading practice that can, that can change in order to do different things. So in the first um, instance, this idea about sort of, you know, limitlessness and um, the inability to um, process information um, selectively. Um, in a later iteration, her reading practice, yes, it's still divergent, but it comes instead to um, sort of target um, the way that capitalist consumerism was functioning in the 19th century. Um, she reads a, um, a magazine that's full with advertisements and she reads these aloud and makes judgments on it. So try Finch's feeding bottle for influence. No, there's a cross against that. The cross means I don't want it. Elegant cashmere robes, strictly oriental, very grand, reduced to one pound 19 and sixpence. Be in time, only three left. Only three. Oh, do lend us the money and we'll go get one. So we've got this kind of process of consumerism in action. And it's again, sort of parody of how that functions. So here, we've she sort of demonstrates slavish obedience to the injunctions and the advertisements. And this is important because the periodical press was kind of the first time where um, advertisements with, would come alongside text. So with the invention of the periodical press in this period, it's, it's, it shows us how new technologies kind of impacted the art of reading. And essentially, we, we're shown through the divergence that how that's working, although we might not realize it ourselves. Um, so she sort of shows a sort of naive literalism in her reading practice um, as she dots between areas. We also have for the first time this idea that you, you don't just leave, read in a linear factor from left to right. Instead, the, these sort of periodicals and the, the, the language of advertising would require a reader to dot about the page. So again, we have this sort of dramatization of a reading practice is actually quite bizarre, even for a neurotypical reader, but that we don't account as bizarre. But then when we see um, Matilda Rag engaging with it on this kind of um, accentuated level, then we are able to see how that sort of capitalist um, consumerism is functioning on the level of text. So um, I'm going to move on to my second case study, and um, I am coming to this with the sort of warning that this is where what I'm working on right at this moment. Um, so um, be nice, um, because I might actually change how I think about this um, in the future. Um, so um, I'm looking at the impact of neurodivergence on narrative when we have a sort of neurodivergent narrator. Um, and the ways in which this might be theorized. So I'm looking at the work of George Eliot, I'm looking at um, a short story called The Lifted Veil. Um, I'll come to The Lifted Veil in a second, but George Eliot is of course most famous for her work on realism. And, um, and she is kind of one of the main proponents of realism. And um, this chapter that I'm gonna quote from in Adam Bede is, is used all the time as an example of an author talking about their practice of producing realism and the spaces between what is authentic, but what is how, a, how an author um, uh, interacts with the real, the, or the notion of the real constructs a version of the real. It can never be a representation of the real itself because that is impossible. So she's writing Adam B in 1859, which is the same year that The Lifted Veil is published. So I think we can connect this kind of anxiety about realism also into the lifted veil. So she says in Adam Bede that, you know, her strongest effort is to give a faithful account of things as they have mirrored themselves in my mind. The mirror is doubtless defective. The outlines will sometimes be disturbed, uh, the reflection faint or confused. But I feel as much bound to 
sorry, my blocks are right in the way of <laughs> the quote. Um, a bit, she, she says that she's going to um, reflect as precisely <laughs> as what she can in that reflection. Um, so, it, you know, as if she were in the witness box or narrating her experience or uh, on oath. So she's trying, but she's aware that um, her sort of ideas about what is real, what is what is accurate, might be distorted. But the lift and fail um, sort of gives a narrative perspective um, from this sort of the central narrative, the central narrator within the text, um, as to what happens when the narrator within that text and that mirror is not defective, but it's enhanced. So we're not dealing with sort of the, the anxieties of authorship, we're dealing with the anxieties of narrator, um, but the narrator that does not filter things through their own kind of defective mirror, their mirror is enhanced. And what I mean by that is because the narrator is clairvoyant. So um, here I'm using clairvoyance as a divergence. Um, and so I want to kind of ask what the impact is of clairvoyance on narrative, on narrative form. So uh, with this being a sort of 1859 text, we've got some very clear expectations about narrative and about linearity. Um, but here, the novel literally opens with the line, the time of my end approaches, and it elaborates, for I see when I shall die and everything that will happen in my last moments. So what, so what happens to a narrative and to a narrator when there is this sense of we know what's going to happen? He knows exactly when he's going to die. He knows how the narrative will end. He, know, he knows how his own narrative will end, but he knows how the text will end. The text indeed ends with the date that he's going to die and he feels the process starting. Um, so, it, so, you know, what can we learn about obligations to narrative if the narrator knows what's going on? OK, um, disability in organized narrative, but narrative inevitably punishes its own purient um, interest in, by overseeing the extermination of the object of fascination. So this is Mitchell and Snyder talking in that narrative prosthesis about how this idea about the object of fascination um, kind of is punished and um, that the, the, the thing must end. Right. So the object of fascination here is the narrator. And that with its narrative itself and the way it's structured with the narrator's end and the knowing of the end, um, we can um, we can sort of situate this discourse within the discourse of divergence. I was kind of going on a tangent there. Um, also with clairvoyance, because he knows what everyone's thinking, there is an expansion of the third person. So it's again, sort of the, these, these critical discourses on narrative. So I'm really interested in how this form of narrative intervention can critique the way that um, contemporary narratives were functioning, particularly in realism. So this isn't a realist text because, of course, the narrator is clairvoyant, but there are anxieties about positionality and authorship and, re and, and realism that come to the fore. What is it as an author to know everything about your characters? What is it as a character within that text to have that authorial omniscience? as a character within text as opposed to an author. So we have this kind of idea um, that Latimer says that, you know, with a super added consciousness, wearying and annoying enough as when urged on me, with the trivial experience of indifferent people, this is kind of him experiencing the thoughts of others. And he becomes extremely reactive and depressed in a sense um, because you can see um, this, the, the suppressed egoism, the struggling chaos of purialities, can't say that, meanness, vague, capricious memories and indolent makeshift forts from which human words and indeed emerge like leaflets covering a fermented heap. So we see the absolute passion there and disdain for omniscience. So my question here, I'm mean, engaging with this text is again, what do we do when uh, a character kind of takes on um, an omniscient role? Um, I'm going to I'm going to stop because um, we're kind of through. But I was I, my future direction for this text and something that I could come back to in the questions is to think about this text in terms of the double empathy problem. So this notion that um, neurodivergent folk and well, this is particularly autistic folk, but I think neurodivergent folk is true. 
this is kind of disjuncture between one another and communication, but that's not the fault of one party. It is also the fault of the, the neurotypical for not understanding the divergence and for the divergence, not understanding the neurotypical and how that cycle functions when you've got one character that knows exactly what's going on in another person's head and then that the other character not able to realize what's going on because they know so this kind of cycle so that's where I'm at with my, with my kind of new piece of work um, so I hope that I've given some kind of indication of where the thinking is I hope that I've given some kind of indication of what we might do because um, like I say this is absolutely um, brand new and uh under theorized, some would say, but thank you so much for listening. I'm really looking forward to having a discussion with you guys. Uh, thank you so much, Louise. We actually don't have that much time for discussion, but there's been a massive chat going on um, at the side. We've only got one question in the Q&A, which I will ask you before we go, because I'm aware we'll have to be done in time to give people a break before the four o'clock case panel. But yeah, I will save the chat at the side. <laughs> oh, no, no, I think it's partly as well, because I had to stop you because of the captions thing and all this kind of thing. So we kind of took a bit of time with that. Um, but yeah, we'll save the chat anyway, so we've got access to it later, because there was loads of interesting stuff about diagnosis versus representation versus uh, cultural analysis and all this kind of thing. So it was a really good conversation. Um, the question we have comes from David Hartley, and he says that he got caught by your term of having to work within weaknesses. Um, such a powerful and thought-provoking note. I wonder if neurodiversity studies is naturally more open to reflecting on personal so-called weaknesses, and that this makes it such a welcoming space that is less driven by competition and the need to constantly achieve. Could this be a way in which neurodiversity studies can help to disrupt the ivory tower of academia? I mean, I hope so, because uh, that would be great. Um, so I, I just think that, um, yeah, I think we are very much open to more experimentation with method. And um, I think it's, I mean, to be honest, um, I think it's a kind of um, a factor of the medical humanities in general. I think there's a lot of really cool stuff being done with lived experience and also ethnography and, and these sorts of stories. But I think that, um, I think that particularly for neurodivergence, um, there is a kind of moment of questioning um, what's going on and how we do things, how we disseminate, how we do things. So I think there is a lot more openness to it. I think that um, sort of collaboration and co-production um, being part of the neurodiversity movement, this idea about removing hierarchy um, from conversation and sort of thinking about neurodiversity as a sort of blend of all neurotypes. I think that, that kind of naturally um, puts itself in a position where um, we want to sort of remove hierarchies and we're more willing to share, more willing to be kinder to one another in academia, which is, this is somehow a radical act to be nice to one another. Um, so yeah, I'm rambling, um, but yes, let's hope so. Um, no, I think that's, I think that was perfect because actually like it's maybe less of a coincidence than you might think that this is kind of emerging at the same time that we're more aware of like the precarity of academia. So I was thinking when I read that question, like I don't think academia is an ivory tower now because I think that it's, you know, there's like no space in the ivory tower, the ivory tower has been destroyed. So that all of us like, you know, yeah, we get, once we recognize that there's no space for all of us in there, essentially it breaks out of it anyway. And this is one way that we might engage. I think maybe it's an ivory tower, but it's like cracked and like someone's put a plaster on it. So that's the precarity. So it's just still trying to maintain it, but um, it's going to crumble, hopefully. Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. Um, still don't have a permanent job. It's fine. Hire me, someone. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then we can start talking about this. Um, <laughs> well, we do a last... Uh, all the questions that I had were massive big questions. I don't know if I want to... Um, ask you like maybe maybe I'll ask you okay um I was interested in what you said about um neurotypicality and the case of like it's defined in terms of prevailing social norms so do you want to say something briefly maybe about how you know it was interesting about how you said that that could be like in a fantasy world like the neurotypicality there might not be the same as what it is in our world were there any examples that you were thinking of or is there anything in your work that kind of deals with that because I thought that was interesting for the conference topic yeah, I mean, it, it was interesting. That, that was an unplanned tangent, so that was interesting. No, no, you're fine. I, I, like, I, I need to, if I'm going to say it, even if it was unplanned, I need to, I need to um, talk about it. Um, no, I think um, I don't have off the top of my head a really, really specific example um, here. 
um, potentially, um, actually, although I've never thought about this text in this context, I mean, Gulliver's Travels, <laughs> Um, there, there are two lands um, that he goes to, the sort of third and fourth land, so not the famous ones with the, with the giants and, and the small people, um, the Lilli Lilliputians. Um, but uh, when he meets the, the Whinnams, which are the, sort of the horses, and they are very, very, um, their kind of idea about neurotypicality, well, that, actually, maybe the third example works better. But anyway, I'm going to go with the horses. Um, they're sort of they're shown to have this enhanced way of socializing and thinking uh, um, at this kind of heightened, very enlightened level. And Gulliver is just a bit of a, of, of a, of a dumbass, really, for, not, for want of a better word. So within that, their sort of normative is, is, is changed. And, and similarly, I mean, like I said, I am not a fantasy scholar and I apologize, but, um, you know, you might have a text where, say, um, communication via um, clairvoyance or, or via telepathy is, is common. So, um, you know, what happens if you don't? Um, so I think that there's definitely space for that. Um, yeah, I think it, it, it's, um, it's very dependent on the parameters of society, I think. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And we've got some examples in the chat of like the muggles and Harry Potter, which would actually speak really well to one of the papers in the previous panel that was about like urban fantasy and seeing unseeing. Um, sorry, the name of the paper giver in the paper don't come to my mind right now. And Squibs and Harry Potter and Vulcans and uh, Star Trek. That's a really oh, good example, like, actually. Guys, <laughs> like, I am certain that it's going to explode in fantasy and sci-fi because it is such a space for it. I just, unfortunately, I'm not very well versed in the genres, but it, I can see that it's going to be a, such a burgeoning area. Um, it's, it's really exciting, but I'm, uh -oh. I'm afraid I'm going to stick with Dickens. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, thank you so much, Louise. That was absolutely excellent. And everyone's gotten so much out of it. And we really appreciate you taking your time to be here today. And I know we didn't get much of a chance for conversation here, guys. So if people want to go and um, message Louise on Twitter to ask her questions there, that would be great. Hashtag fantastic med hums so that we can all kind of join in with that would be great. Um, yeah, so I think we'll all say thank you. I'm sure everyone would be doing their clap reacts if they could right now. And very much. I'm going to try and creep in the chat for a second if that's all right but yeah um, yeah go go creep in the chat and um yeah and we'll see you all at the creative panel at four o'clock thanks everyone thank you Bye. Bye. <laughs>